What skill do you consider to be the most important in terms of international and intercultural competence? If you had to pick one that if you're going to be dropped into an organizational environment, which one should be the most imperative for you to master if it's for talking to somebody like you? Anybody want to take a stab at that? Okay, Vinny, I knew you'd go first. Thank you. I'll, I'll, I'll just um, share. Uh, Vinay Gupta, uh, I'm the servant in chief at uh, a very revolutionary company which is uh, uh, deeply associated with ASU, Zero Mass Water, based out of Scottsdale. Uh, we make water from air. Uh, so, so in my experiences in dealing with uh, uh, many cultures across, across the globe, I come from India, I'm an immigrant too, um, is setting and managing expectations and really walking out of any discussion, understanding what you understood versus what the other party or the counterparty understood is very critical because I may interpret something in a very different way as you are expecting uh, a very different answer and both of us walk out of a room or a conference or a communication uh, meeting and uh, we, we come back with different answers. So I think an alignment on what's the end goal what's the expectation in walking into any meeting or any discussion per se. Uh, the discussion could be in person in a room or it could be 10,000 miles away on a v video cast. It's uh, something that I've found to be extremely, extremely important. And then knowing the cultural nuances in terms of what's understood, what's the meaning of the verbiage, uh, yes means in a certain culture versus uh, uh, a commitment in a certain culture uh, from those perspectives is what I'll give as, as an opening uh, remark. Uh, James Allers, the general counsel at Malera Alvarez. It's a small consulting firm. I do a lot of work with Mexico. And I'll uh, uh, latch on to something that Vinayak mentioned, which is understanding the perspective of the other party. So I would say the most important skill is empathy. Um, and I'll give you an example. Well, people define empathy in many different ways, but you know the simplest way is just being able to stand in somebody else's shoes and see the world from their perspective. So when I first moved to Chile as a, as a young man, I was a journalist, I went to a pharmacy there, and I went to just buy something simple from over the counter, and I was struck and extremely frustrated by the purchasing system. I had to go up to somebody at the counter, tell them what I wanted, then they had to go get it, hand it to somebody else, who then put it in a package, who then took it over to the register, and then I had to pay for it, which I found to be extremely inefficient. Um, but I was coming from a very American, and I shouldn't say American, I should say United States, perspective of efficiency is the most important thing in the world. And you have to really slow down and try to uh, understand the perspective of someone else, or you will be constantly frustrated. Um, if you, if you can't step back and say, maybe I'm viewing this way because of my cultural lens, and maybe there are other factors or values that are more important than efficiency. Maybe um, you know, a pharmacy in Chile wants to employ five people instead of two, um, and there's a community value behind that. So I think that's a really important, empathy is a really important skill to exercise in any kind of international work. Good morning. How are you today? Great? Well, how can you say great? I mean, if you are in France, like I'm coming from, there have been some strikes, there has been the weather has been too hot, and if you go to a French setting, I mean, people are gonna think you're weird to say great, because you're not great. So you have to realize that when somebody tells you, how are you today? The French people would tell you, well, there's this thing and that thing wrong and so on. And uh, that's the way it is. So, and you shouldn't have prejudice against other people. For example, I understand the person from Malaysia. They may notice that I have connection to Indonesia. How do they feel about the people in Indonesia? Well, the people of Indonesia don't like too much the way they are treated by the Malaysian people. So when you go do work in uh, Indonesia, you got to be aware of that. The time uh, making meetings in Asia, very pe in Asia in general, there's a lot of inconsideration of other people's family life, which is value in the Western world. 
and I will do another practical exercise. Can you get together two by two, please? Well, just do it where they are. So, but if you don't okay. Move. I'd like you to, to, to get up and kiss each other on the cheek two times. <laughs> go ahead. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Come on, go ahead. No. Yeah. Uh, we're in Paris now. Yeah, we are in, in we're France. We're in France now. Oh, in yeah. Belgium, it's uh, <laughs> one time in, in Wallonia, three times in Flanders, uh, in Brussels is two. But, okay, so you're a little bit reluctant to do it, okay? Uh, for example, I had a um, company that was in Chicago, that came from France to Chicago, asked me to hire a um, general manager. And so I heard somebody very smart, and um, I took him to the headquarters in Paris and he just was having a hard time because in the morning in the offices everybody kiss, kiss each other on the cheek. So uh, he said, I'm not going to do that, it's disgusting. I said, well, if you want to have a relationship with the people working here, you better get used to it. Um, I can understand it because he was from Ohio State, but that's another <laughs> issue. <laughs> Um, so, yeah, do not discriminate other people. Other people things do differently, and you understand that because you're here. Um, little details, you know, uh, have to be uh, put into perspective. And one of the things I want to, uh, my background is organization development, behavioral science. And uh, if you've taken some classes in organization development, you understand there are certain technology, certain uh, systems whether it's open system, social technical system, or action research model, all, that, all those are tools, but that can ab be applied to better understand uh, how to get uh, into another culture. Do your research, apply what you've learned at ASU to cultural differences, and you'll find out that it works. Uh, what your professor has taught you is very important, and there's a reason why they taught that to you. How about you guys at the end? I'll add a couple of times. Okay. okay. Bruce Young. My name is Bruce Young. I'm with Interstand Manufacturing. Uh, we deal with Belgian companies, our parent companies. And, you know, one of the things I found was uh, if I keep an open mind and I'm not judgmental about things, it goes a long ways. Um, you can get preset notions. If I would say, I don't understand why French people think Jerry Lewis is that funny. He, they, they believe he's the funniest comedian that's ever lived. You can't hold that against them. But there are, there are serious social issues that when they're raised and they're brought to your attention may prejudice you if you don't keep an open mind. I, I was shocked to find out that in Belgium, um, they're one of the few countries in the world that euthanizes children. And I, I was shocked, but I, I really didn't understand it. But it wouldn't be an issue I would ever want to bring up in any sort of business context, it would be something I wouldn't want to prejudice or, or uh, not keep an open mind to a society that thinks it's a progressive notion and I, I simply don't understand it. And as Americans, often we think our values are reflected uh, across the world and, and uh, so we really can't presuppose that, that our values are necessarily shared and I really do try to, whenever dealing, especially in Europe, uh, it, everybody wants to lump Europeans into one group, and it's, it's a vastly different group. There, there are people who hold different views, different values, and I find it interesting. And so if you can look at it as an interesting standpoint and learning about another cultural, um, cultural group, it, it'll go a long ways towards that. But I think keeping open mind is a, is a great thing, so. Yep, I'm Chris Williams, the CEO and founder of uh, B60, We're a, a management consultancy and technology development company that works with uh, businesses. Uh, we're headquartered in the UK. Uh, we have a place here in Phoenix. Uh, we work in the US and Europe as well. Um, in terms of the, the, the specifics of the question, which was uh, you know the single skill, I must uh, I must accept that empathy is definitely the big one in my experience, and I feel that throughout this session there'll be a common thread. Um, that comes along with empathy, and that is communication. You know, success in any culture, in any diversity, 
relies on effective communication, and I think that's one of the biggest, most single important skills alongside empathy that anybody could have. Uh, and that doesn't come always naturally because of cultural differences. <laughs> it takes effort, it takes time. Um, but having that open mind is crucial when developing those communication skills because we all communicate in different ways at different levels and communication isn't always verbal, as we'll see as some of these questions unfold. So thank you. I'm going to build on that in, in a way. Um, and what I'd like to, from a frame of reference for everybody in the audience and anybody who's online, think of it not just from an employer's perspective. Think of it from a coworker's perspective. Think of it from a potential client. Think of it from a perspective of a boss. Think it of a perspective of a subordinate, somebody that's working for you. Every one of them is, is a potential person that could be culturally different than you are. The question I have right now is, it's a build on on this one. In today's world and going out five to 10 years, where your interaction with clients, bosses, coworkers, could very well be virtual, where you're not sitting next to the person, you're not face to face with them, but you're doing something over a conference call, you're dealing with them maybe through an email, through some sort of online chat. How again do you become very now you're dealing with time differences, somebody who's at the end of their day, somebody who's at the beginning of their day, and sometimes you don't know the nature of who's online, the title, the hierarchy of who you're working with. How do you also balance the cultural difference where, in say in some cases it's, it's a video conference, and the nonverbal, you know, if, if you're not paying attention, you're on your cell phone. What what are the things to avoid, even if it's anecdotal stories that you can bring to mind? Because I think it's, it's, it's an interesting discussion to have. Yeah, and, I'll, and I'll start with, with that. It's an incredibly interesting thing to have. You know, I did, um, I did a little bit of research looking at uh, some, of, uh, some of the stuff that we're going to be going through. And um, in terms of communicating feelings and attitude that um, w when you're in meetings or whatever else, the statistics actually are quite interesting and I'm, I'm, I was shocked and I'll see if you guys are too but the research shows that only 7% when communicating feelings and attitude comes from verbal communication. 7%. 55% comes from body language and 38% comes from tone of voice. So when you link that directly into virtual communications with an audience that's multicultural, cross-border, your communications become vitally important, especially on a video conference, especially having your cell device sort of sat up, facing upright, or whatever it is. These things in certain cultures are deemed as to be rude. Now, you might be using it as a tool to take notes. You know, so the communication that you have is, is critically important. But there's some interesting statistics there. Um, so hopefully that resonates when you think communicating with people in a virtual environment. The other one is tools. And communication tools are, are vital, but it's selecting the right tools. Now, um, Michael uh, D. Watkins uh, wrote an article in the Harvard Business Review on this in 2013, and I'd recommend you go and look up that article, where it gives 10 tips. Uh, it all came out of a LinkedIn post sort of th three or four years ago, but it's definitely one to worth lo looking up. I, I could go through them, but I won't steal his thunder, but it's a very good article about tools and communication with cross-border uh, people and also having that uh, virtual communication channel when dealing with a multicultural uh, view of things. So, yeah, definitely look that one up. It was Michael D. Watkins, 2013, in the Harvard Business Review, and it's 10 best tools um, on approaches to, to dealing with virtual communications. Well, th there, there are really some challenges, uh, whether, whether it's a simple time zone challenge. Um, if, if you're in the U.S. and, and you're talking to somebody as, as I am in Europe, you have a very narrow window. So if, if I can speak to somebody from 6 o'clock to 8 o'clock in the morning and it's late in the afternoon for them, and you, you have this kind of tag team thing, you're, you may have a lot of things going in the morning. It may not be your sharpest time. It may be you need to get into your day. They're at the end of the day, and they may be exhausted, and so you're coming at it from different perspectives. Same thing going from, from west to east. 
um, you may have to have a call at eight o'clock at night here for somebody in Japan. And, and uh, so it, it is challenging and, and there is a lot that gets lost in translation, uh, literally. Um, there, there are simple, simple things that get really, really misunderstood. We had one challenge at first because a couple people would, would send emails and they, they would say in the emails, I demand you do something. Well, at least that's how it read. But that's not at all what they were inferring. They're just asking you to do it. But their language skills are such that it's taken as demand and everybody was offended. You can't demand we're doing this. And it's just a simple, simple thing. And we had uh, one person that would use exclamation points crazily throughout his emails and everybody took offense. That was just his style and he, he didn't mean it to be that emphatic, but it came across that way. And so um, we found the video conferences would be more successful. Um, email is very terrible where you, you think because you've had conversations with people that their mastery of the written language is the same thing as the spoken language and it really is a big chasm there. We have one gentleman who is very, very fine in person but I clearly can tell in emails he's just simply not understanding and, and so you need to be able to, to cipher that out and figure out exactly if you're really communicating. I think even after meetings uh, we want to tend to have a wrap up and send it back so we summarize and make sure that people are truly understanding but um, we've all touched on it and that making sure people actually understand what you said and the way you believe it um, is important. I've, I've had things that I, I think would be simple take weeks to get understood so somebody else take a crack. I'll, I'll take a quick one here. Um, just actually building upon uh, what, what you folks said and the answer to the previous question, really empathy and uh, you know keeping an open mind. But uh, one of the things that I have always practiced and used and I found it very effective is to really focus on what and why. What I mean by that is what is the subject matter and why we are talking about it. Most, most common mistakes that people make, and I'm guilty of that too, is that we end up focusing on who versus why. So if you keep that perspective in mind, it doesn't matter if you're talking to a person who's three levels higher or three levels lower than you, or he's, he or she is um, you know, 10,000 miles away. If the clarity in the expectations that why we are talking about something and what we are talking about is there, then you know you take out you know, non-essential emotions from the discussion. So I'll pass that on uh, as a feedback, uh, something that I've used effectively over the past 20 years, dealing across all five continents, and it works out pretty well. The first uh, advice I would say is do not make jokes, and that always translates bad and will communicate bad. Um, I'll be very brief. Um, the other gentleman there said, gave a good information. Uh, read the uh, Harvard Business Review. It's got some very good article on uh, cultural differences. And uh, that's the two points I want to make. Just quickly, I, I think uh, Chris and Bruce were dead on when they said communication tools are important. I would say my watchword would be context. So. Use communication tools that allow you to put those conversations in context, particularly if you're dealing with people in a virtual environment. Um, how many of you uh, have one of these in your pocket? Or your bag? Everybody, right? Raise your hand if you use it more for texting and emailing than you do for calling people. Right? So pick up the phone. Um, it, it can be an, an amazing uh, tool when you're talking to people, uh, when you're trying to communicate with people, if you can have an interactive conversation, um, it's much more effective. And when you're dealing with people in other offices, like I manage two offices in Mexico, I don't know what's going on in their life. I'm just talking to them by email or by phone. Um, you know, I might not hear from my, if I didn't hear from my Mexico City partner one day for several hours and I didn't happen to know that there was an earthquake in Mexico City that day, um, you know, you, you have to uh, put things in context if you want your communications to be clear. I would 
put uh, one more word. It's not because you're talking to an American that he is American. Look at the differences between us here. So consider that Americans come from different background and uh, cultural environment. So don't make assumption about it. So I'm going to direct this question. I think the young lady, you know, if you are from somewhere else in the U.S. and you're possibly looking for work and how do you manage some of the cultural challenges. One of the things that I've observed is um, when you have a hierarchical structure in a U.S. environment and you bring them into a meeting and let's just for argument's sake say that we've got a meeting with a visiting group from China. The Chinese group has an extremely hierarchical nature to the people that are there. Now what you'll find is that the Americans, for the most part, when it's, there's an open discussion, every one of the Americans is going to feel empowered to be able to be part of the discussion. They may make eye contact with a superior, but at least the notion will be, if you have something to contribute, the what, that I think Vinayak was discussing, you can do that. But I think in some other cultures, there will be one person who will likely speak for the group, and you won't get the interaction or any kind of group think. You'll get one person. It, can you discuss a little bit more about that? I mean, it is encountered. You do see that, and you have to be aware of status, respect, and, and go down that route before maybe you can open it up and, and get at a broader dialogue with, with other people within an organization. Yeah, I think I think a uh, very valid point and uh, certainly have encountered some of these uh, challenges. So I think I think um, don't have a clean cut recipe for that. Um, I think a lot lost the speaker. Um, the, the way we have uh, dealt with situations is we have pre-designated spokespeople spokespersons uh, for the groups that are going to be interacting from that perspective. And when, once you have that, it's, it's essential that both spokespersons have alignment of expectations as to what is expected and what is a conjecture from that uh, point of view. Once you have that clarified, it starts to pave the path of an effective communications. And sometimes, you know, you'll still find challenges and you have to set people back on track. But, but generally speaking, if you do one of those two things, from my experience, I found them to work pretty effectively. I'd probably just add a, a little bit to that, and building on all of the comments uh, that, that have been made, is um, relationships. Um, you have to build relationships in your careers as they evolve. Um, we now live in a global economy within new uh, opportunity is a key word. What lies ahead for anybody graduating is a fantastic opportunity globally. Uh, and building those relationships, as the gentleman quite rightly said, you know, when you're communicating, putting things in context, is to pick up the phone, is to meet people in person. It's about having that opportunity to, to liaise and, and talk with people and develop relationships. You can do that virtually, but you can do it in person too. And for somebody that travels as often as I do, I can tell you from personal experience that my investment of time in relationships and taking the time to understand people, their cultures, and, uh, and embracing that and building those relationships has been one of the most positive things, uh, not just for me professionally, but for me personally and my own personal development. And I think making those comments specific to your particular questions of earlier, that was, I think, if you can build relationships both virtually and physically, wherever it is that you want to progress your career in whatever country that is, it's taking the time to understand and meet people, but to build that confidence from within to, to reach out, because you'd be very, very surprised at the amount of, especially in the US market, I found this, when you reach out to very senior people in organizations and just ask for help, how many people would be delighted to help you? I, you know, I was in uh, human resources personnel for many years with hired a lot of people. And I'll tell you a secret. The decision to hire you or not to hire you is, you, is done within 10 seconds of the interview. 
That's very profound, and that came from Alan, by the way. Let me, let me build on the relationship side of things, because I think there's, there's a bigger rabbit hole to go down there. <clears throat> there was a foreign company visiting Arizona probably three years ago. The CEO came with a large group to Arizona, and we met with a uh, local municipality here. The, uh, the group that was visiting was met with the mayor. They were seated at a table. Very formal, handshaking, one group on one side of the table, the other group on the other side of the table. And interestingly enough, the lights dimmed, which caught everybody off guard. And the mayor of the town proceeded to bring in a birthday cake and placed it in front of the CEO of the visiting company. And let me tell you that the discussion, which would otherwise, I think, have been much more formal, it was a big icebreaker, but what it succeeded in doing, there was an immediate bond between the mayor and the CEO of that company. And coming into that meeting, that CEO was indifferent. They were looking at New Mexico, they were looking at Arizona, they were looking at Nevada. The minute that birthday cake showed up, the d decision was made. The mayor had succeeded in distilling it down to, I looked up who you were, I found out something about you, and I wanted to make it personal. And, and I think in a way that Chris intimated is, in the day of the internet, where you can find out a lot about people, find out a lot about them, understand them, so when you go to an interview or you're in a meeting with somebody and you know that they just came back from a trip because you saw it on Facebook, or you saw that their, their kid brother did something, or somebody had a baby. Don't underestimate the value of, of that kind of information, because in that instance, it, re it turned into a $10 million investment, 200 people working here in Arizona because of a birthday cake. Does anybody want to weigh in on just being aware and, and being able to take that and use it? Okay, I'm not taking it from there because I totally disagree. If, uh, <laughs> if you're dealing, for example, with French people, uh, they will look like you're absolutely weird to talk about their personal background or anything personal. I've had a lot of clients coming over here in Arizona and I teach them, I say, don't feel offended if people ask you how many kids you have, you know? That's the differences between maybe Western Europe, the real Europe, and uh, the United States. Anybody else weigh in? But otherwise, I would say that's France. <laughs> yeah. Well, look, it, it's interesting, isn't it, that there's a classic example of culture. Mm -hmm. the, the example given was that the mayor had done an incredible job of understanding his audience and credit where credit's due. If that individual was French, I'm sure he wouldn't have done it yeah. <laughs> because of the cultural differences. And it's a great example. And it does build on relationships. Again, um, I can give you a, a, an example of something quite similar where uh, some years ago, we were dealing with an organization that we'd actually uh, pitched with some business to, to win some business. Uh, and sadly, we didn't win that particular contract. A competitor won it from another organization. Uh, this was a European company. Um, and I wrote a personal note to the managing director of that company, thanking him for the opportunity, and said, look, completely respect the decision that was taken. Um, asked for some feedback, and the feedback was very simple. The company that they ended up selecting was round the corner, so they felt that the, that the location would have been better because we were in the, it, we were in the UK. The reality was is that six weeks later, I got a phone call and was awarded the contract because there'd been a challenge. Now, I was told quite categorically that if I hadn't have written that handwritten letter, which I knew meant something to them, it, we wouldn't have won that. So sometimes the point being is, is that those relationships are important. It's important to do the research. But it's also important to understand that sometimes, whether it's an interview, whatever it is, be remembered, be remembered. And you said only when we were chatting earlier about being the number two, <laughs> you were remembered. 
and that's so hopefully that that makes sense um, building on on those points so so I found that trying to force the relationships where sometimes uh, <coughs> people perceive it as kind of stalkery if you go in and you've done a little too much research on a person and you talk about your granddaughter's wedding and the, it, it creeps people out so I, I found that one of the w best ways is really through sharing a meal, breaking of bread together. And uh, I've always had an expression, the waters of the world divide us, the wines of the world unite us. And most, most everybody I've met have some sort of interest in wine. And I found through discussions on wine that we <coughs> end up people revealing more of their travels and their other life. And you're connecting with people on a personal level. And I think if you go do research on people and you don't actually have a passion for a shared interest or any sort of shared interest, uh, it comes off as disingenuous as you're trying to sort of force that, oh, badminton's one of my favorite sports, and you go on about badminton and you don't have a care in the world about it. But if you can find and identify things that you actually do have shared passions for, that, that's really a bond that can form. Um, but I think you need to be sincere about building relationships with people and that the sharing a meal is a great way to do that, so. I know we've only got a couple of minutes left, but I want to give another, how you deal with kind of a, a bit of a stumble. I'm sure you've all had those moments where you have to quickly think on your feet and turn a situation around. And I'm going to give you a personal, exa personal example. 20 some odd years ago, uh, I was working in Pennsylvania, middle of Pennsylvania, and we were installing some Italian equipment in a manufacturing facility, a lot of equipment. And uh, it was the biggest order that this Italian company had ever had. And the CEO had intimated at some point in time they would like to make a visit to the plant to see their product installed. Never gave us a date, never knew when to expect the guy, but clear out of the blue, the guy shows up. And he shows up to this massive manufacturing facility. It's a Tuesday morning, and there's nobody in the parking lot. There's a lone security guard. And the Italian gentleman pulls up, and he's somewhat infuriated because this is me showing up. I want to be received. And the guard says, well, who are you? Well, my name is, in this case, it was Vitek. Uh, what are you doing here? Well, I'm planning on making a visit. You have my equipment. And he says, where is everybody? And the guard says, it's the first day of hunting season. We have the day off. Well, believe it or not, that's for real. In Pennsylvania, the first day of hunting season, no one works. So the guy, infuriated, went back to the hotel, spent the first day of his time in Pennsylvania, sending out emails or just not knowing what to do. He shows up the following day. None of us have known that he's even been there because it was the lone guard. We usher him in. He's very quiet, very stern, and we're trying to get to the bottom of what happened. First of all, we're glad you're here. And he says, I can't believe that yesterday I showed up and it was the first day of hunting season. I'm an important man. I'm busy. We did everything we could that morning to make him feel nice, calm down. It didn't work. So we quickly retreated to a restaurant thinking, let's try the meal angle. Let's break bread. Somehow we've got to make this work. And it's a large, if you've been to Pennsylvania, these big eating areas. It's massive. Two or three hundred people, family style dining, just food everywhere. And we're, we're just, you know, stunned. Now, I'll go back to one of the other things we talked about. This gentleman happened to be an Olympian for the Italian national team. He was a fencer, and he was a medal winner. And uh, some sort of anecdotal information that didn't mean much, right? Um, but again, food gets served, and a bunch of us at the end of the table are trying to manage this. We have to make lunch work. So we leave the table, we're talking to the manager about how we, how we can quickly get fed, maybe get back to the office, when one of the um, waitresses comes up and said, hey, who's the distinguished man in the really nice looking Italian suit? Oh, that's fascinating. 
Well, he's an Italian. He's visiting here. Really? I've never met, never met somebody from Italy. Can we, can we meet him? Next thing you know, all of the, the wait staff want to come over and meet the guy. Someone pulls out a Polaroid picture, takes a picture of the guy. They learn that he's an Olympian from, and no one knows what fencing in, in, in Williamsport is either. They think it's, it's putting up fences on somebody's lawn. But the lunch went from a, we were there for hours. The people in the restaurant wanted to meet him. The wait staff wanted to meet him. And you slowly watch the guy's temperature and demeanor come down. That he all of a sudden felt accepted. He was bonding to people that three hours ago he was ready to disown them. Hunting, I can't connect with these people. When they warmly embraced him, they had no idea what his day before was like, but they welcomed him. Now that's a really, really long story, but one where I can tell you my career at that company hinged on a goofy Pennsylvania holiday and making this guy happy. And, and I have to thank the people in both instances. The people of that town were what made it work. They were what pissed him off and they're what made him feel welcome. So if there's any really bizarre story there is, think about how when you're dealing with those moments and you're on your feet and you're having to navigate something that could mean your career, your job of the moment, or your boss's career, or a client, or a promotion. I'd just like to ask in the closing moments if anybody has any fun stories to tell that can leave you with an impression that a lot of this you can't make up, and just be prepared for it. Just in, in the back of your mind, you're not always going to have the upper hand or see it coming. Anybody want to jump in? <laughs> I've got a few good ones, but I'm mindful of time, so I, I'm going to tell the one that I uh, that that always sticks with me. About five years ago, uh, no, I suppose not that long ago. Actually, probably a bit shorter than that. I was invited as as part of a UK delegation to the Far East, to uh, Kuala Lumpur in Malaysia, uh, and I also visited uh, Japan, and. The Japan part of the leg, I wasn't due to attend. I'd, I was due to sort of come back, and for one reason or another, I ended up attending. But I'd never done any business in Japan. So I very quickly started to look up on etiquette and reviewing business cards, et cetera, et cetera. What I wasn't advised was is that the two meetings that had been arranged for me um, were going to be non-English speaking. I'd had to have an interpreter with me, which was completely fine. But unfortunately, the interpreter wasn't that good. <laughs> um, and it transpired that the second meeting, the first meeting seemed to go pretty well, and because they, they, there was, their, their English was far better than my Japanese, so we, we, we moved pretty quick. But in the second meeting, the two gentlemen came in and, they sat me, and we sat down, and there just seemed an atmosphere. It just didn't seem quite right, and I couldn't understand why. And the long and the short of it was, was that, um, I'd forgotten to ask for the business cards and take time to look at the business cards and understand who they were. Completely my fault. And I realized this and I felt incredibly embarrassed. And I thought, I don't know how I'm going to turn this around. So as I decided to make an apology, I knocked my laptop screen by mistake, meaning that my laptop screensaver came on. And on my screensaver was a proud picture of me with the co-founder of Apple, Steve Wozniak, which to these two gentlemen, he was a legend and a god. <laughs> so all of a sudden, the awkward conversation became that I was this guy's friend, and they ended up taking photographs and <laughs> of me, and they were asking if they could have photographs of them and could they, bring, they, could they ring some of their colleagues to come down from the office. And we, all, and we were all lined up in front of the Union Jack flag with me having photographs. And <laughs> because I'd, I'd managed to get a sneaker photograph with Steve Wozniak like two, uh, I don't know, 12 months previous that I was incredibly proud of and perhaps embarrassingly had stuck on one of my screensavers on my laptop. And that is a serious true story. So there you go. <laughs> I will say that not necessarily a funny story, but uh, when I when I first got to the company, I wasn't aware about the holiday differences being so vast. And one of them 
was the taking the three-week holiday in the summer. And so I'm managing a supply chain that includes doing sea containers and a multi-month delay and all of this. And I realized that my emails weren't being answered and nobody had clued me in that, no, they were gone. They shut the factory down and there was nobody there, nothing to be done about it. And you'll just have to wait. And I, I, you, we're just not used to that sort of thing. And so, you know, when I look at the Belgian cal calendar, I'm a little envious because they have 20 holidays, seemingly like they're on holiday every week, but uh, they're not. But also conversely, for workers I have here, so I, I manage a manufacturing facility, I have workers from multiple cultures. And so I have some, some workers that are from the Philippines and they have an even more enviable calendar. I think they have 28 holidays, but um, being mindful of their holidays and actually being able to celebrate and include their holidays as part of ours um, has gone a long ways towards sort of building bonds between those workers that people, you really have to be, and that's when you're in an international um, cultural kind of situation, being aware of the other culture and what they celebrate uh, is important. So I would just add that as a thought. Nothing funny, but. Any other anecdotal stories before we do a round robin here? I got a quick one. Um, I think you were actually present for this one, Hank, with uh, Mayor Stanton. So this goes in the category of understanding uh, hierarchy and how it works in other cultures and not making jokes. Um, so I, bl I think Hank and I were present at this meeting. The governor of the state of Sinaloa in Mexico came to visit a couple of years ago, and he's sitting across in a meeting from Mayor Stanton. Mayor Stanton doesn't speak much Spanish, and the governor of Sinaloa didn't speak much English, so they had translators there. So um, Governor Ducey had recently taken office, and Governor Ducey being a Republican, Stanton being a Democrat, Stanton thought it would be funny to kind of needle him um, because he knew that the governor of Sinaloa was going to leave the meeting with Stanton and go meet with the governor of Arizona. Um, so Stanton says, well, you know, here we consider it a demotion when you go from mayor to governor. So part of me is sitting there hoping that the governor of Sinaloa's translator doesn't translate this accurately, but part of me is thinking this is gonna be hilarious. Um, so his translator whispers in his ear and he just gets this look on his face, very stern. He, he did not appreciate the joke. So he then whispers back to his translator, and Stanton's just laughing, he, he thinks he's really funny. <laughs> um, and so he whispers back to his translator and his translator says, in Mexico, we consider being a governor like being an archbishop because you're next to the Pope. <laughs> <laughs> Any comment, Alan? No. no. Okay. No. It, okay. Um, we've got, by my reckonings, two minutes left, and I'd like to open it up to any questions. And if you have none, we'll give everybody a 20-second final comment. Any questions from anybody in the audience? Yes, ma'am. Uh, in terms of like communicating like the actual business that you're doing, how have you So before I get asked for questions, could you give us more of a context? Are you meeting them socially? Are you meeting them on business? Is it a first meeting? Is it a referral? Is it a, you know, any of the things that will help frame, it's a very broad question. Yeah. So, like it's just kind of like trial and error. Okay, Chris, you want to go? <clears throat> you know, it, we touched on this earlier about research. You know, the biggest tool that you've got in front of you is your cell phone and Google. <laughs> so when you are perhaps uh, have an opportunity to meet somebody and you've got some time to prepare for that, it's just to look, it's, it's, to, it's to research it. So the reality is, is that, you know, where there is a, a vast cultural difference between what 
you have and perhaps, you know, say Japan, we'll we use that example, where actually handing somebody a business card, it actually means something to, because it's, it's a gift of, of, of something, to take the time to read it front and back. That information is readily available, and I would say it's just important to, to research and pick up on it. If you're thrust into a situation where perhaps you're meeting with people who, and you've had no time to prepare and, res and, and research, I think it's about being open and genuine and showing interest in, in, in other people. Um, we talk about skills earlier today, and uh, we've talked about empathy and communication, which has been a common thread. But also, one of the most important skills that you can have um, in your career is to listen, um, and not to be the one who's doing all the talking. You will probably find that in most, as your career progresses, that the people that move forward the quickest and the most respect the fact that they've only got one mouth and two ears. I think I'll just add to that. Uh, absolutely very well said. Uh, just, just um, you know, researching a little bit about the tradition and normal practices in that culture and knowing their care about would, would, would go a long way. Uh, alongside one of the things that I typically use is once I'm meeting somebody from a new country or a new culture is uh, just just trying to break the ice by, you know, show how I have practiced their tradition uh, when I first meet or greet them either in person or via uh, virtual communication. And then uh, I offer them with a way out not as, a, as, as, as something that I force it upon them, is here is something fun I like to do, and I was hoping you might enjoy that experience uh, joining me in that. And, uh, and if it's something that you don't like, we can do something else. So, so it kind of gives the other person an ability to communicate with you. Very simple, basic, but also uh, allow them to immerse and experience your part of the culture while giving them your uh, uh, opening, opening the doors to their culture from that perspective. I use that uh, typically. I think you have a unique opportunity being at ASU to meet people from every country in the world. Uh, you can go to, I'm sure you have an international club, you have an international dorm, you have all kind of association. When I came to this country from France, before I came, for example, I went to the American church in Paris, I went to the American library, I went to the American cultural center, I dated a lot of American women, and I'll be honest with you. <laughs> and then when I came to this country at the university, um, I made a point not to be in the international dorm, but actually to be among American. And it taught me a whole lot, believe me. And so I would say, try to get to know people, and uh, that's the best way to really get to know. And, the networking will be useful for you in your future career. My final comment, and then I'll ask you to give me a great round of applause for simply five wonderful individuals that joined us today. An early mentor of mine, I'm gonna build on something that Chris said, and he said, listen, listen to understand, don't listen to reply. And there's a big difference because many people listen or at least attempt to listen because I'm formulating a response. I, I want to have a thought on something. Do it the other way around. Listen to understand. And I think you'll, you'll be much better off. But in closing, thank you for being here. I hope this was helpful. But if you would kindly join me in thanking five wonderful people for having been here today and for having participated. Thank you.